year, we had the pleasure of working with doctors Carbiano and Esterling to explore reproductive health bill sponsorship and co-sponsorship as they relate to intersectional legislator identity, as well as uh, community health conditions. And we're very excited to share what we've learned with you today. So jumping into it, uh, there are two overlapping issues at play here. The first is that women are underrepresented in state legislatures. Um, and this has been proven uh, time and time again by empirical evidence in previous literature. So uh, in fact, under the current systems, it's gonna take us 145 years to close the gender uh, gap in politics. And this is not including the uh, intersectionality of race and gender, right? So if you look at the graph here, this is from the global, uh, I'm sorry, the 2020 Global Gender Gap Report, which is run by the World Economic Forum, and it ranks uh, glo uh, global gender uh, equality progress. In the report, the US is the 53rd out of 153 countries. Um, oh, okay. So the yellow bars here show um, educational attainment levels across the countries of Canada, Mexico, and the US. Um, so uh, they're generally equal, right? However, the US has significant disparities in the areas of political gender equality, and that's seen in the brown bars in just a second. Um, and this measurement alone is bringing down our ranking overall. So we know that this is a problem for policy because uh, their gender and race make women of color uh, approach policy through a unique lens that other legislators do not. And again, this is backed by empirical evidence from previous literature. The second issue we're exploring is that abortion bans harm community health conditions, particularly among populations of women of color. So we see this in the states that have limited abortion access since overturning Roe. Among these states, there has been a 34% increase in maternal mortality rates. You can see this in the graph. While these rates have been increasing steadily over the past few years, there has been a significant jump since Dobb was enacted. Moreover, these rates among women of color are the worst. Typically, these populations face the most significant healthcare disparities. Focusing on black women, for instance, we can see that their maternal mortality rates have nearly doubled in only four years. If we look at other indicators of community health, like infant mortality rates, we can predict that these rates would nearly be 15% lower if there were as many women in Congress as there are men. Again, this is not to mention the intersectionality of race and gender. Um, moving on to our research question, um, so we ask, are women of color legislators more likely to support reproductive health policies? We evaluate this under three criteria, the sponsorship or co-sponsorship of the legislator, whether the bill is pro or anti-reproductive rights, and we use case studies of California and Texas as representatives of red and blue states. In this way, we'll be able to show the importance of diversified legislatures, not only on health policy, but also on health conditions, which the previous literature has yet to address. So at this point, we've mentioned the term intersectionality quite a few times, and before we move on here, I wanted to just pause and give a general overview of this concept, because we use it as a framework for the work going forward. So in general, the term intersectionality describes the multiple life experiences and potential discrimination that one faces, when uh, inhabiting one category, or more than one category that society deems as less than. So here, women of color would be an intersection between gender and race, where that old blue arrow is, um, because they might be impressed by not only their status as a woman, but also their status as a minority. Um, this is absolutely a simplification of the concept, um, but for the sake of our research, this is what we chose to focus on as far as race and gender intersections. So related to all of this are the theories of representation. Um, the guiding idea behind our work here is a descriptive representation, and that states that not all constituents are going to be adequately represented in a legislature if there are not uh, legislators who look like them. So again, with the example of women of color here, a black female constituent would need a black female legislator in order to um, speak uh, and power into that position. And then that connects to symbolic representation as well because when there are fewer or none women of color legislators, women of color constituents then are seen as having less power and less respect in their daily lives given this um, decrease in political power. Because of this, we hypothesize that women of color legislators will be more likely to sponsor reproductive health policies than their white male counterparts. 
So now we'll be getting into our data and study design here. We want to examine change over time. So we employed a longitudinal analysis from 2013 to 2021, evaluating each legislator per assembly year. Now we have more information on where we got our data, but for the sake of time, we'll leave that for the Q&A session. But in general, we use the official lower house legislator websites to code for demographics of each legislator. We use the Legiscan website to code relevant bills related to many parts of reproductive health, including mental health for pregnant women and postpartum women, contraceptive and healthcare access. In the end, we coded a total of 350 relevant bills and we used the American Community Survey to get an idea of district characteristics and demographics. Uh, moving on to our measures, so we had three dependent variables with six measures related to the bills we coded for, total count, uh, total count that were pro-reproductive health, and total count that were anti-reproductive health. So these bills were coded twice by two different researchers for intercoder agreement and merged based on legislator and assembly year. Our independent variables um, included variations of the race and gender of each legislator, and we held legislator party assembly year and district characteristic constant so that we could be sure that these results weren't based on any of the um, extraneous factors. Uh, moving on to our analysis, so we run our analysis among both states separately uh, by using a negative binomial regression because the dependent variables were counts. We use the estimated marginal effect to look at the differences between model predicted average number of bills for each gender and racial group of legislators. We held white men um, as our reference group so we could compare these race and gender differences to those who have complete political representation power. All right, so before we get into testing our hypothesis here, we'll start out with some descriptive statistics. The first is in regard to representation over session year per state. Um, if we look at the graphs, we can see that there are similar representation of women of color in both states. Uh, and then in contrast, white women are very well represented in Texas, which is interesting, right? But what we really need to look out for here is what these white women are proposing and passing in Texas. So uh, here are the descriptive statistics about our dependent variables, and those are sponsorship and co-sponsorship. We're looking at the average total number of bills that are sponsored and co-sponsored for each state. And if you look at these graphs, we see that Texas has many more co-sponsored bills. Um, so there's more variation in Texas than in California because the counts, the counts were on average higher in Texas, but we're still using the same model selection to analyze the data. Um, and then in Texas, legislators are also more likely to co-sponsor bills just because, whether this is pro or anti-reproductive health, just because this is a very easy um, political action to take rather than sponsoring or authoring a bill. Now let's look at the total sponsorship in California. We did not find any differences between our independent variable and our reference group of white men. And interestingly, we found that California did not have any um, anti-reproductive health bills to analyze. Next, we're gonna take a look at Texas sponsorship. So here we see that while women of color did not differ, differ from our white male um, reference group, white women were more likely to sponsor both pro and anti bills. Uh, moving on to our findings for bill co-sponsorship in Texas, uh, I mean in California. So in California, we found that all women, whether people of color or white, um, are more likely to co-sponsor reproductive health bills than a reference group, which is white men. Um, so this is more of a gender effect for co-sponsoring bills than it is for a racial effect. And for our findings for bill co-sponsorship for Texas, we found that um, white women are more likely to co-sponsor anti-reproductive health bills. Uh, there's another interesting finding um, here that men of color are less likely to co-sponsor anti-bills. So this was unexpected, but also tangential to our overall research question. However, if we wanna focus on our research question, we did not find any differences between women of color co-sponsorship and our reference group white men. So in connecting these findings to our original hypothesis, we see that in general, there aren't results that we expected, but in California, there is a gendered effect for who is more, like, more likely to co-sponsor pro-reproductive health bills, which means that women overall, regardless of race, are more likely to sign on bills that promote reproductive health. 
Based on these results, we can argue that women of color co-sponsor pro bills more often than sponsoring them because of unbalanced political power. So in accordance with the concept of intersectionality that we've discussed, white men are most powerful political players here, so they're more likely to be able to pass bills, whether those are pro or anti, through their sponsorship. Moreover, we found that white women also have more power than women of color since they do not face racial discrimination. So that's partially why women of color are still only co-sponsoring bills. So given all of this for our policy recommendations, we suggest barriers of entry for women in the political space that should be reduced because of the gendered effects, um, which seem stronger in passing pro-reproductive health bills. But additionally, to increase women of color political power, we also recommend assigning these individuals to relevant committees and leadership positions once they're in the legislature, um, which can hopefully in turn begin to shift the historical and institutional power disparities from inside out. Uh, these also follow the evaluation of criteria of equity and political feasibility between both states. All right, so we want to acknowledge that these specific results are not going to be generalizable to any other issue area besides reproductive health or other states that might be less blue or red, right? Um, but going forward, we uh, hope to be able to explore the effect of district on legislature behavior even more. Um, so this would include looking into the particular, how particular districts fare uh, on community health conditions pre and post Dobbs decision. Um, which was the one that overturned the right to abortion. And then additionally, we would like to see how the Supreme Court decision affects other issues that are of importance to social equity and health outcomes uh, more holistically. Thank you so much for listening and for the incredible support during this process. We are so grateful for our community and excited about the potential ripple effect of our research. Thank you.